Hey, everybody, welcome to the Daily Objective. And uh, we're going to be talking about BLM leader gets rich hypocrisy. Um, that's a good question, isn't it? Now, uh, please uh, feel free to super chat us your support questions or comments. And also, please join the Ayn Rand Center UK as a member for exclusive content, study groups with some wonderful objectivist thinkers, as well as helping this thing grow. Um, I am here with a guy who I used to call the last of the Greeks, but recently I began calling him the Greek myth. It's Nikos Sotirakopoulos. How are you doing, Nikos? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for the new nickname. No problem. Uh, try to live up to it, will you? I will. Uh, so, okay, so Black Lives Matter, obviously it's a, it's a sentiment in the, in the minds of many people, but it also is a, I think, a trademark, right? It is a... Um, it is a not a corp, quite a corporation. It's it's a nonprofit, but um, nonprofit doesn't always mean the same thing to different people. Let's just say that. So recently, the meaning you can have a nonprofit, and maybe there's a cap to how much money you're get the nonprofit is earning, but you're also getting paid to speak somewhere. I mean, anyway, there's a there's a lot there's a lot that goes into that whole world. But point being, the uh, co-founder of BLM official. Uh, I'll try to pronounce this. Patrice Kankulor, Z Kulor, uh, purchased a $1.4 million mansion, which uh, I'm not, I didn't call it a mansion. That's just what the headline says. You could buy a $1.4 million house. It's not necessarily a mansion. Anyway, point being, uh, boy, she's doing quite well. I, I'm glad to hear she's not struggling for money. But how we approach this can be a little bit challenging because it's so easy and people do this all everywhere. They say, oh, th th that guy over there is making money. He's getting paid. Interesting. Is he grifting? It's always, it's always whoever's making money is disingenuous. This is the standard people, the premise people hold. If they're making money, don't trust them. And the, and the best defense is, I'm not even making money to say this. I'm not even getting paid right now. That's the best defense. But uh, as I think uh, we know, and as we try to uh, highlight on this network and on this show, uh, money is a requirement for living. And if you're providing a value that somebody wants, you absolutely should get paid. And the most wonderful thing in the world is to be able to get paid to tell the truth or to get paid to promote justice and what is good. So there's no conflict between the two. It just people get a bit suspicious. Uh, now, in this case, uh, it, we're, we're talking about Black Lives Matter. It's very easy for people that are hostile to the organization to say, well, sure. That's, so that's what this was about, huh? It's about you buying a house. It's about you getting money put in your bank account. Uh, how do you look at this topic? Okay, so since my days in the left, the most annoying criticism I used to get because I was coming from a relatively well-off middle-class family is, oh, you're a socialist, but I don't see you driving a Lada. For those of you who don't know, Lada was the iconic Soviet car. By the way, I would be very happy to drive a Lada Niva because it's one of the best chips. But anyway, that's another discussion. So, and, or it was, oh, you're having a cell phone. How, you're a great socialist, a socialist in a cell phone. And I always found this argument so silly. A, because my argument was never back then that being a socialist means you're poor. Actually, the argument was that all this is great. It's the fact that capitalists cannot deliver that that we're fighting against. But anyway, that was a wrong argument from my side, but this does not mean that the criticism was legit. So the problem with that criticism, with the criticism that focuses on hypocrisy is it does not do the heavy lifting. And the, head, the heavy lifting is telling you why your ideas are wrong. Now, it's a different discussion whether that person lives up to the ideas. So then we'd have to do two different discussions. The first discussion is, what are the ideas that this person is advocating? Are these ideas to be applauded or not applauded? And if they're not to be, if they, if they, if we manage to define these ideas, do they live up to them? Is a secondary question. Let me give a completely exaggerated and ridiculous, and I'm not making an analogy example. If someone tells you, let's say I'm a, I don't know, I'm a, I'm an anti-Semite. You don't tell them, oh, but I don't see you going around uh, hunting uh, uh, Jews and stuff. Your, your argument should be, okay, why? And uh, is this a good way to go through life? Are your ideas legit? It's not, why don't you live up to, 
to your idea. So I think whether someone's ideas are good, bad, or mixed, and to be decided what their ideas are, that's the process to go. And usually I saw, I saw, for example, Candace Owen saying, oh, how come you go, not only you bought this house, but you went to live in a predominantly white neighborhood. First of all, we don't know if she bought this as an investment or to go and live there, but even this is the case. So should the standard be, oh, you're a movement that uh, promotes racial thinking, so you should go and live secluded uh, or in a God knows, God knows where. So I think this discussion is a bit boring to me, but what is not boring is to see whether it is a legitimate discussion. So let's start with the, with the beginnings, okay? So what would hypocrisy mean? Hypocrisy mean I'm preaching one thing and I'm not standing up to what I'm preaching. And what is its opposite, if we want also to discuss a bit of objective virtues? Integrity. Integrity means that my thoughts, my ideas, my values, and my actions are all congruent, are all in the same line. So the first thing then to decide is, is uh, Patrice indeed a hypocrite? So shall we, start, shall we start checking out what are her ideas and then see if there's, first of all, if they are good ideas, second, if she's a hypocrite. Shall we start with that? Yes. Okay, so from what I could gather from interviews, so many people say, they would point the finger that says, oh, she says she's a trained Marxist. Now, this doesn't tell me much because for the vast majority of people nowadays, being a quote trained Marxist means that you use the anti-capitalist rhetoric more as a, as a, how to put it, as a gesturing, as a signal that I'm against quote inequality or quote injustice. So to begin with, this itself does not tell me much. But there's more to this case. So if you go and see some of her interviews, it doesn't look like she uses her Marxism and her anti-capitalism as a soundbite. So for example, she tells in more than one interviews, or at least that's how the interview is presented, that she has actually read her Marx, that she has actually read her Lenin. And actually I found very interesting, she also read her Mao, Mao Zedong. And she says, reading those social philosophers, quote, provide the new understanding around what our economies could look like. Now, I want to make a first pause here. <laughs> Milton Friedman was forever saying for spending 45 minutes in the same room with Pinochet, where otherwise he was critical of the Chilean regime. And here you have someone whose movements or the trademark of the movement which he represents is being celebrated by everyone in polite society, saying that she was influenced by the biggest mass murder of the 20th century, and that totally flies and there's no issue there. But anyway, that's not the issue. This is just a parenthesis. And also, what we figure out is that quite often, she indeed considers that wealth is a privilege, which comes with a question mark. So for example, we found out that in one of the previous circles, cycles of BLM protest, she was in Los Angeles and she went to protest in a Beverly Hills neighborhood. This is from a Times article. And it says, it was the largest march she had planned at that point and the first in a predominantly white and wealthy community. And here the BLM activist says, I say that they, those who come for brands, have to confront the police presence today but that this is our everyday, she means that it's her everyday reality. And then she says, as far as I can tell, every single person within reach of my voice, this is how she addressed the people who were having brands. And all of them white, as far as I can see, put down their champagne glass and their silver fork and stops checking their phone or having their conversations. And then every last one of them bows their head. So it looks like Patrice is considering that being white or eating brands in a good neighborhood comes with a package. And this package is that you bear this, maybe not guilt, but you are not really in tune with the problems of society. So we see quite a, I would say, collectivistic view of the world. And within this view of the world, it is, part of it is that wealth comes with an ideological prism, which is what crude Marxists would say. 
So my first comment is that the first thing to be criticized here are the ideas, but also if so, so first we establish this, the ideas are bad. And then as an afterthought, we would say, yes, by the way, there's also a bit of quote hypocrisy or not hypocrisy, but you seem to believe that wealth comes with this privilege. How do you know that this does not apply to you? But again, to me, this is the boring afterthought. My main issue here is the oozing collectivism. You are white, you're rich, bow your head, you don't get what is happening. I think uh, there, whenever we're dealing with idealists or ideologues, I don't know the difference between those two things, really. Um, whenever we're dealing with idealists, people who have a certain vision in mind, um, they're bound to, I mean, we do need to give them, uh, provide them some context, like that we're not currently living on, in that ideal that they're striving for. So whether we hate or love their ideal. So uh, a common, common criticism of Ayn Rand is, well, if she hates, if she's such a capitalist, why did she collect social, collect her social security? Or why did, um, you know, any, or you could also say, oh, why did she drive on the public roads? Why did she walk on the public streets? Why did she, whatever, anything publicly funded? Why did she enjoy the protection of the government, you know, that was publicly funded in her lifetime and still is? Um, and, and, and even more based in quotation marks, and even more based criticism of Rand that people have actually said unironically is, Rand got a free education in the Soviet Union and then she <laughs> bad mouths. People say this. But I mean, it's all the same argument, whether it's Social Security in her late life or education in the Soviet Union. She was in a certain context that she did not ask to be in. She has a certain ideal in mind where where she wants to take things, where she wants things to be. And in the meantime, when she's acting, the question is, why are you doing this? So why I'm collecting Social Security if it still exists when I'm old is because I paid into it and I was screwed by the government in many other ways, robbed opportunities as well as taxation. So anything I can do to get my money back is, is, is legitimate. Somebody else might collect it because they think it's truly the duty of the young to take care of the old. And that person is immoral when accepting the same check. So why are they doing it? So in the case of uh, her, yeah, she's got this view where whites should all bow their head and apologize and do what they're told as good allies. She, I think she's saying we need to get to that place. And maybe when we get to that place, she's going to act in that, I mean, we're not going to get to that place because it's it's a utopia and that cannot exist. Uh, dystopia, any, I would say. Dystopia, but it's um, it 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 it's a, you need to suspend your disbelief to uh, imagine it even taking place. But I think any criticism you make of her now, as far as how she's acting, she could sort of justifiably say, "Look, I'm we're trying to get there." I mean, with any socialist, even if you remove the racial component, with any socialist, communist. Uh, you, you know, like you used to get the criticism, oh, you own a cell phone, uh, enjoying your capitalism. And the flip side of that is like, oh, you use GPS and internet, enjoy your government, you know, subsidized government developed <laughs> technologies. The point is, we're in this context, we're trying to get rid of the bad and increase the good. We're trying to get to a certain place. And until then, we need to, you know, we'd be, we'd be fools to not use uh, the technology and the opportunities that we that we have in this context. Uh, thank you for the super chat, by the way, Jeff. Five Canadian dollars, nice guy. So the question, this question here to Patrice then is: Look, Patrice, from what we saw, looks like you're a proper collectivist. You you actually walk at least you talk the talk of collectivism. So to judge whether you're a hypocrite or not, although it sounds like, again, you consider that privilege. There's something iffy with it but could you tell us what your ideals would look like therefore we could judge you so she told for example as i said that she learned from some very hardcore marxists including marx himself and lenin and mao what would uh, what would uh, i don't remember the exact phrase was uh, uh, something like what our economies would look like so i haven't seen though from blm something about what economists should look like. By the way, parenthesis, as you said in the beginning, very important. There's not one BLM movement. There are at least two foundations that Patrice is related to, and there's a distinct Black Lives Matter network. But again, you more or less, you get the point. So, which is something I've never really got from Marxists, and this is one of my biggest disappointments. What exactly do you want to achieve? Do you really, are we serious here that you want to eliminate private poverty? 
You push them a bit, they will say, okay, not really private property, but private property in the means of production. Then you push them a bit more. Oh, does this include, for example, the laptop? Because in the days we're living, a laptop is a means of production. Unless you're like a vulgar Marxist of the 30s who thinks that only the factories are means of production. So we see that not only the ideas are bad, but it's difficult even to understand the ideas of someone who seriously considers themselves a socialist. So again, where do I get with all that? That it's difficult to decide whether this is sincere or not, because we don't know what sincerity would look like. What we do know, though, is that these ideas are, at least from my point of view, to be criticized and condemned. Why? Because there's an oozing, a very strong collectivism, judging people not as personalities, as individual personalities and characters, but as members of groups. So that's, for me, the biggest red flag here. But I have another topic I want to throw on the table. For me, the question should be asked not so much for the leader. The question should be asked about all the big businesses or small businesses who threw all that money. Again, as you said, you know, <laughs> good job. You managed to make that money, good job. And again, nothing morally condemnable in the act of getting money itself. My question is those of you who funded someone who claims that Marx and Lenin and Mao uh, give us some good ideas. And again, maybe the Mao was something that the journalist, let's, let's give all the benefit of the doubt. But someone who is so friendly to these ideas, you business people who gave her all that money, have you thought what you're doing? Have you thought what would it look like if these ideas that you promote, that you even tolerate, and even worse, you sanction and actively promote, what's it going to look like when they happen? Actually, recently, we got an example. The environmental cause, which is, again, a cause that everyone bows their heads big businesses, the capitalists, everyone. Did you hear in the news that in France uh, recently, the other day, there was a ban on short haul flights? So if you can reach a destination by train in less than two and a half hours, then a flight operator is not allowed to fly there. And, all, and many flight companies are saying, but we are in deep trouble. We are struggling after one year of uh, the pandemic. My answer to them is, brothers, you asked for it, as Ayn Rand would put it. You have sanctioned environmentalism. You have sanctioned these ideas. It was clear that these ideas would turn against you, as to me, it is clear that someone who is either a hardcore committed socialist or socialist by default, sooner or later, their ideas are going to turn against businesses. So if you support such ideas, soon you will see the results of that. So I don't criticize the activists. I mean, I do, I do it all the time. But in this case, I want to say, those of the people who threw all that money to that network with the very questionable ideas should ask some serious questions to themselves or whether they ask them or not, they're gonna see the results soon if they haven't seen them already. Critical thinking is hard, or it's not that hard, but you have to know how to do it, and you have to do it, and you have to remember to do it. And uh, when we live in a world where, like, Amazon are the only ones kind of talking back to the uh, regulatory politician, and in the same breath, Amazon is asking them to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, it's like, you know, yeah, it's okay, we got businesses funding BLM, they're saying, yeah, as a society, we need to solve this problem. Are you saying you want the government to now carry out this this ethical uh, calling that you're describing? Because that is what we're seeing. Like we're seeing Biden and Kamala Harris talk about that. And not, maybe they're already pa pa signing or passing some stuff relating to right there. The, the stimulus, I heard something about like funding businesses of color first or more or something like that. I mean, there's a there's a real life consequence to what people believe. And when people people need to be very clear. So, yeah, the, most of the people that are funding BL, BLM, they're not thinking that far ahead. Like what what is the world that these this organization is actually pushing for? What does it look like if this principle is taken to the extreme? And uh, businessmen, unfortunately, are often not philosophical. Um, 
they are not philosophers. They need philosophy, but they often don't have it. So to them, like individualism is like nowhere on their radar. Like or they, they use that language. Like, yeah, everyone's a person. America is a place where every person should be treated fairly, no matter their race. And BLM seems to stand for that because they're saying, you know, stop hurting black people. All right. And so we, we support that. We're for that. We're, we're for inclusion, equity. Right. Um, but they're not thinking critically. They're not really thinking about where their money is going. Also, thank you, Jeff, for the 10 Canadian dollars. He says, I forgot you like USDs. That's true. I do. Uh, the value you guys offer me is worth more than our dollar. Very true. I'm Thanks paying so for, much. I'm, really paying for, I'm paying for food of the mind you produce. Um, that's well, such a nice, that's such a nice compliment. By the way, let me remind people something. We did a whole episode the week before, I think, on Black Lives Matter and what is our criticism, I mean, mine and yours, because we might not have the same criticism to the movement and its racial outlook to the world. So there are many grounds to, I think, to criticize BLM. For me, the fact that the founder has bought a mansion is not very anywhere near top of my list. Also, if you want to see a more sophisticated analysis from an objective point of view on the argument from hypocrisy, Ben Bayer of the Ayn Rand Institute had an article in the New Ideal, I think it was on the 20th of September or somewhere like that, where he talks about hypocrisy. And he talks about uh, people who criticize Greta Thunberg, the iconic uh, environmentalist, or socialists for having iPhone, or, as you mentioned, and we did a whole episode on it, criticizing the Ayn Rand Institute for getting government uh, the relief money and of course, this was addressed ad nauseum, but for people who want, they can find it. We even had a daily objective episode. Maybe our production team at the end of the YouTube, when you can see suggested episodes, include the episode we did on BLM and the episode we did on Ayn Rand getting a quote, a welfare money or whatever that accusation was. Anyway, Raga, any parting words or shall we move to Clubhouse? Let's jump uh, there in one minute. I just want to address a, a comment that is not a super chat. The good student seems like a good student, but he's dead wrong in this case. He says there is no way to make money being an anti-Semite. So it is an honest opinion now. So there's just everything is wrong with what he said. First of all, the fact there's no way to make money from it means it's honest as opposed to if there is, if it is lucrative, then it's suspect. I mean, just right off the bat. Um, I think he's wrong, but more importantly, or as importantly, or importantly, he's very wrong about this saying there's no way to make money being an anti-Semite. There is a booming, booming. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. Can you, can you read the comment again? The original he, comment. He, he says, there's no way to make money being an anti-Semite. So it is the only honest opinion. Meaning when they say it, believe them because they're not, they're not grifting. Oh, I see. I see. I see. So, and that's, that's just very wrong. First of all. I mean, there are bank accounts that are frozen and like PayPal bans people that are that get on their radar. But there's a, a very lucrative um, sort of industry around the freaky new right, whatever you'd call them at this point, alt right, whatever they are. There's a lot of people that want to fund that those figures, those people. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of people making money. And if we should sort of step away from that ex extremity and just look at uh, the right in general, what it's become with this populist, this populist uh, kind of cry against big tech censorship, this cry against, um, you know, just non-Trump Republicans, just this, this Trumpian Republicanism is a very, very, very lucrative uh, industry right now. Like Steven Crowder, in my opinion, is trying to get banned from YouTube. I think he is actively, in my opinion, vi trying to get banned from YouTube in order to get even more money than he's currently making because, you know, getting reprimanded by big tech is the most lucrative thing if you have a mobilized audience. But I know I'm opening a can of worms. Okay, but to be one, just one thing on that. Yeah. Uh, I have no knowledge on the anti-Semitism thing and whether their money can be made. That's not the point on whether it's a good or a bad idea. It's a bad idea because it's a collectivist idea. The same thing we said earlier. On Crowder, though, think about Stefan Molyneux, for example. Do you think he's making more money now? Yeah. Have you heard? Really? I, I mean, maybe his, his, his bank, like the ability to send him money has been made impossible because of, let's say, the bank cut him off. 
but but other short of that uh if people are able to send him money i'm sure he's i, I my opinion is he's making more money than he was before I, because I it, see, gave, it, gave him, the, it gave him it gave him cult status it gave him cult status to get deleted from youtube and he was struggling on youtube he was talking about oh i'm not making enough money and you you know he was like basically begging for money on youtube because the mania around him was long since uh dying out now that he's an outlaw uh a lot of people want to send him money and uh fund his his philosophizing slash uh begging the jewish question so yeah absolutely uh alex jones i would also guess is making money hand over fist so yeah you're, you're i think you're a little bit um off off the mark on this one i haven't got knowledge on this but again from the top of my head i would consider impossible that someone who had millions of using individual videos on youtube is better off being away from youtube again the question is simple when was the last time you heard about molyneux there's if you're not if you're not on youtube if you're not on youtube it's it's I wouldn't say you don't exist, but it's way, way tougher than if you are. I but anyway, you're, that's you're, you're a bit of a boomer. I hate to use such insulting language, but there's, <laughs> a, there's, a, there's so much ways to make money once you've had a presence on YouTube. And now you're the guy who got banned and a whole lot of people with money in their pocket, like who believe in your cause. In my opinion, Molly, who's making more money, uh, the good student who I gave my attention to goes, lol, Molly, barely gets any views. Well, first of all, please don't laugh at me. I treated you with respect, but also the good student, he was banned from YouTube altogether. So please, uh, you know, obviously the point that he, do, he barely gets any views is uh, besides the point because he gets no views. He is banned from YouTube back in the summertime. Anyway, the, uh, the alt-right was banned from YouTube, he says. Anyway, I'm going to stop arguing. By the way, the let me, okay, one, yeah. at some other point, mm -hmm. it's very creepy what has happened it's okay. I understand Amazon saying I'm going to move material away. The other day, last thing, and then we go to Clubhouse. I was doing some edits in my book, and I, I wanted something from Breitbart's most popular article in history of Breitbart, which is the Milo Yiannopoulos Alum Bokari article on what is the alt-right or what is the, a guide to the alt stuff like that. Anyway, I took the exact quote from my book and put it on Google because something was weird syntax wise and i wasn't sure if it is the exact quote it was impossible on google to find the article then i went to breitbart i found the article manually and the article exists but in google it disappeared again this has nothing to do yes okay breitbart but i get all that the fact that you google one of the most read article about a political phenomenon and you cannot find it on google i found it really creepy like what's the danger that people are going to read the Yanopoulos article from 2015 and get excited about the alt-right which probably doesn't even exist anymore okay anyway. yeah there's a there's a lot that needs to be explored uh you know Seamus in the chat room is saying I agree it's possible to make more money from the Streisand effect that's when people want to see something they're told not to photograph or not to see I mean Seamus Sh you're talking about hypotheticals I'm talking to you about observable fact when somebody retweets out, oh my God, my YouTube uh, video was demonetized. It gets a bunch of retweets and people want to go over to their website. Steven Crowder is making ungodly money right now. And the day that his YouTube is completely terminated, he will, will be the most lucrative day of his life, in my opinion. I'm talking about facts, not just what could happen. Um, but anyway, I mean, uh, yeah, so John asks, aren't leftists anti-Semitic? Yes, I mean, le the the left uh, largely is, but that's not like their state admission. They, you sort of have to kind of um, follow their uh, reasoning and kind of take a closer look to see what they're up to. But whereas this fringe right that um that I brought up, their basically their their stated philosophy is that they see Jews the way that like BLM sees white people. You know, like that the they, the BLM thinks whites are orchestrating everything and oppressing them. That's how these freaks see the Jews. So no matter what a Jewish person says. He's manipulating them the way they see it. Let's jump over to Clubhouse. Uh, I know we've opened the, all these cans of worms, or I did. Um, we will be there in two minutes, guys. Rather than immediately after we end this, uh, Lord Emperor says we'll be there in two minutes. So, guys, in two minutes, see you on Clubhouse. We're gonna, we want to hear what you think. All right, guys. Thank you, Nikos. And, thank you. and we'll be back here for the Daily Jab tomorrow, same time. Goodbye. Bye-bye.